everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's the last Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Move Well to Age Well with our resident plant-based physical therapist, whose name, after one year, I finally can pronounce, Eileen Kupsoftis. And today she is going to teach you how you can train for strength no matter what your age. Please welcome her back to the show. Kupsoftis, Kupsoftis. Yes, yes. <laughs> I did that so well, AJ. My oh, husband would be very oh, proud of you. <laughs> nice, I never heard that name before. Well, people love you, Eileen. They, they learn so much from you. And I know a lot of people have actually become your client or taken your boot camps from your thorough presentation on just about every bone and joint in the body. So today is something that's going to be very useful because a lot of our viewers are a little bit older like me. And while we may be pretty good on the cardio and the diet, we honestly aren't doing the strength training. So tell us, motivate us. What do we need to do? Yes, yes. And hopefully I prepared some slides. I, I like to show some pictures because, you know, they're worth a thousand words and you're not just staring at my face. Um, but it, it's so important because so many people think, just because they're getting older. I mean, I'm 65 and, you know, it, it's, we think that, oh my gosh, I can't, there's so much, I don't mean to spin my words here, but I want to get this out right. There's so much information out there that spins a completely wrong understanding about aging. And I have really made it my mission this past year to turn that around and to get you know the the megaphone out and tell people that you don't have to decline as you get older it's really not a rite of passage to need disposable underwear or a walker or end up in a nursing home there are so many things we can do to prevent that and diet is a huge part of that but also mindset and if we're constantly bombarded with the wrong information, or I should say inaccurate or less than accurate information, then we get this belief system going on. And then I'm not talking like, you know, woohoo, where, oh, if I believe it, it happens. But it, what you believe is true is going to change and alter the actions that you take. And it's the actions that you take or don't take that creates the issues or doesn't stop the issues. So I've got some slides here and I am going to, hopefully I can share my screen. I forgot to check before we went on. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I, I enabled it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. And because usually I ask and I forgot to ask. So here we go. All right. So hopefully everybody can see that. Perfect. All right. So Yes, we're going to train for strength no matter our age. And I'm going to give some information first because education is key so that you've got the right mindset, the right understanding. And and I, you know, I, I chose a couple of different things to cover here. In, and obviously this can't be a four-day seminar, but uh, I am doing a five-day boot camp coming up at the end of the week where we're going to learn a lot more. But hopefully this will get you started. So it's important. This has become one of my favorite statements, authentic human movement. And I taught a class in my anatomy, uh, in my academy this morning, and we did one of the movements. And one of the students was like, that doesn't seem like that's authentic. Like I would actually do that. So I had to explain that while it wasn't a common movement, we would call it an uncommon movement. It's still a movement that our body can do and needs to be able to do to prevent injury moving forward, because if we never do it as an exercise, then if we have to do it in real life, we risk injury. So you want to know what's authentic. And there's a lot, there's a lot of points to that. That's really important to understand. And then when you know what's authentic, then you do make better choices and you have improved results. And then of course, I don't want anyone here to hurt themselves. So please make sure it's safe for you to do the movements that I'm going to show once I'm done with the slides. I'm going to teach lots of modifications. So no matter what your starting point is, ideally you'll be able to do something, but it's really critical that you know you're safe and it's okay for you to do. Now, I'm going to just touch on these three topics because I do want to get downstairs and teach some movement, but um, it's important that you know a little more about these three topics than you may already know. Some of you may already be experts in this field, but hopefully no matter where you're at in your education, you'll learn something from these slides. 
So I want to start off with the functions of muscle. And a lot of the times we don't know some of these functions. Yes, we use our muscles to move. We use them to maintain a good posture. Or some of us are stuck in a really poor posture and we want to learn how to train our muscles to improve that. They also provide a lot of stability to the joints. And stability is not just balance. And I, and I teach this a lot. Balance is your ability to maintain a position. Stability is your ability to regain your balance if it's been disrupted. So there's a difference between balance and stability. If you stand on, you know, if you pick up a foot and stand on one foot and count to 30, that might improve your balance, but it won't necessarily improve your stability or your ability to regain that position if it gets disrupted. So there is a difference and stability has to be trained in motion, not stillness. So and then, of course, our muscles are really good at producing heat. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, and of course, if you've ever been out in the freezing cold and you shiver, you, you know, oh my gosh, and you can get really, really tired from shivering because it requires a lot of energy of your muscles. Some people will have increased pain in their shoulders, their neck, if they're out in the cold. And that's why those muscles that are already battling something that's impaired or not working right in the body are now being asked to create heat which requires more contraction, which leads to more pain. So uh, our muscles do a lot of things. We got three different types of muscle and I'm not gonna go into the details of anatomy here, but your skeletal muscle, which is what moves your body. You've got smooth muscles, you've got cardiac muscles and they all have different functions. Now, there are some different characteristics of your muscles. They can get excited, which means they have this ability to respond to stimulus that occurs. Um, and then the contractility also responds to stimuli. And then they're extensible, which means they have an ability to be stretched without getting torn, as long as you don't go beyond their limit. And then they're very elastic, which means they can return to their normal shape. You know, some of us who are getting older, our skin kind of loses some of its elasticity and doesn't really return to its normal shape anymore, but your muscles don't lose that ability. And then there's four types of contractions, and I'm going to not really focus on these per se, but when I teach the movements downstairs, I'll explain about an eccentric contraction. But isometric just means that you're, you're tensing the muscle, but there's no movement occurring. Isotonic means that the same amount of tension occurs throughout the movement. And then concentric is when the muscle gets shorter. So my bicep gets shorter when I bend my elbow. And then eccentric is when the muscle gets longer and my bicep gets longer when I straighten my elbow. So those are the different ways it contracts. And it's important that your training really kind of focuses on the eccentric. And that's because that's how your muscles really, or your body is really designed to perform in real life. And a lot of us focus on concentric when we're training and, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's the flip side of the coin. So we have, some of you may have never learned this before, but we've got different types of fibers in our muscles. So you take one muscle and you're going to see some, what are called slow twitch or type one or red fibers. And you're going to see some fast twitch or type two or white fibers. And they each have a different type of an ability or, or how they work in your body. So slow twitch is, is the really endurance fibers. So you've got your long distance runners, your, your activities, your physical activities and sports that require a lot of endurance. Those athletes are going to have hopefully more slow twitch fibers making up their muscles. They're very fatigue resistant. Um, they focus on those sustained smaller movements and postural control. Your postural muscles are mostly slow twitch because they've got to constantly be at work to hold you upright. They do have a lot more mitochondria, which are the little, um, little energy in the cell and myoglobin, and they're very aerobic in nature. So there's a lot of oxygen required. And then they're much smaller than type two, but they're surrounded by a lot more blood supply, which is why they're red fibers. And that's also what supports the aerobic uh, work that they do and their ability to resist fatigue. Then you've got your fast twitch or your type two or your white fibers. And those are what are mostly used in strength training. They support really quick, powerful movements. Um, they're, they're, they provide much bigger, more powerful forces, um, but for shorter durations. And they fatigue quickly, which means if you're doing repetitions with weights, 
you're not going to be able to do that for an hour with the same muscle, whereas you could run for an hour. So hopefully that makes sense. And they're a lot more anaerobic, uh, which means that they, they're not really counting on oxygen per se, and they have a lot less blood supply, which is why they're called white fibers. Now, I put this in here. This is for those of you, you know, there's always two types of people, those who love all the details and those who just want the cliff notes. So I put this in here for all of you people who love all the details. I am not going to read this to you so that your eyes glaze over, but you can see that a muscle contraction is extremely complex. There's a lot to it. There's a lot that goes on. There's a lot of things that are required from, from one point to the next. And it's, it's very, very uh, explicit in how a muscle fires or contracts or um, you know performs its function. So there's, there's a lot to it, but know that your body knows what the muscle needs to do. And unless you have some hor horrific debilitating disease, it's working. It's just a matter of how well is it working? And just know that, you know, in a, in a healthy and, and I'll say young person, you know, we're talking about no matter your age, when all these chemical and mechanical sensory systems detect that your muscles moving, they turn on a whole big number of specialized chemical pathways within the muscle itself. And then those pathways in turn trigger the production of more proteins, which is why a lot of people think they need a lot of protein for their muscles to work right. Um, that then get incorporated into the fibers. And this is what causes the muscle to increase in size. So, um, it, it, you know, the overall effect of all of these exercise induced changes is to cause your muscles to get bigger. That's the whole point. When you're strength training, you want your muscles to increase in size. Now, a lot of women are like, oh, I don't want to end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And, uh, you know, I'm realizing, you know, the next generation, we're going to have to pick a different name because some people might not even know who he is at this point if you're younger. But, but you know, women aren't going to look like that. Just so you're aware, when you look at female bodybuilders, they're doing a lot of really specific things to get big, to show those muscles. And, um, and it's highly unlikely that's going to happen to you uh, unless you're doing some massive weight training with a lot of weights, lower reps, and, and doing a lot of other things. So um, you know, using regular weights, you're not going to end up looking like that. Trust me. Okay. Uh, let's move on to muscle nutrition and hydration. This is, this is really important. So yeah, I, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of history here because it's, it's kind of fun to look back and see what we used to believe or, or where things came from. And, um, you really do need optimal nutrition in order to have optimal physical performance. It's required. Now, many of you watching this, you know, you may not have any athletic design. You may not be wanting to enter a marathon, um, or an Olympic event, but, Nutrition is important, especially if you're concerned about losing muscle as you get older. Nutrition is a big part of that. And if you want to increase muscle mass and get stronger, nutrition plays a key role there. So let's just look at a couple of slides on history. Back in the ancient Olympics, you know, back in, in BC times, 776, uh, until now, both scientists and athletes have been debating, arguing, disagreeing about the perfect diet for athletes. And, and why is this? I, I don't know if it's just human nature, but it, it's been going on since, since then. And, uh, and, and you can see, even see here, doctors in ancient Greece and in Rome, so different countries, wrote about nutritional plans that athletes used to prepare for competition. And you can see there's a big difference here. We've got some of them said animal meats, oxen, goat, bull, deer, because you know they didn't have cows back then. Um, moist cheeses, wheat and dried figs, big difference here, and then liquor and special potions. So it, it's really kind of comical. You know, we can think back to when we used leeches as well, right? And then back in the 1938 Berlin Olympics, the Olympic athletes that were competing at Berlin, they focused on the animal foods, the, the meats. And then they regularly dined on, you know, two steaks per meal. Um, sometimes poultry or chicken, you know, turkey. Uh, they average nearly half a kilogram of meat every single day. 
And then in pre-event meals that regularly consisted of one to three steaks and eggs, and then supplemented with meat juice extract. Oh, just the thought of that grosses me out. And then other athletes stress the importance of carbohydrate. So you see here, there's a big dichotomy going on. Um, Olympic athletes from England, Finland, Holland regularly consumed porridge. Now there is a big difference as well. And the Americans ate shredded wheat or cornflakes. That, that's back when um, Kellogg's you know, started moving into the world. Um, but they did use milk. And then you had Chileans and Italians, which feasted on pasta. And then members of the Japanese team consumed a pound of rice every single day. So all, the, all around the world, all these athletes were consuming different diets. And yet they were all competing. They were all what you would call pretty stinking fit and able to perform their sport of choice. Now, what's going on currently? Athletes have been experimenting with a lot of different nutritional protocols. Oh my gosh, there is probably as many as there are days in the year. Um, lots of supplements um, and other substances, some that are legal, some that are not, and they're constantly having to update their guidelines for what's legal and not because new things are created. And if it's not on the banned list, then they can't say they can't use it. So they're constantly updating the banned list. Um, but all of these athletes are trying to find what you can call the holy grail for in enhanced physical performance. They just really want to win. And then, you know, it's very important that we use high standards in evaluating how useful and safe these different dietary plans are. Um, the supplements that are being recommended or boosted out there, and then the other substances for athletic performance. And sadly, much of the evidence, and I did put that in quotes for diet and supplements are testimonials, advertising, industry-sponsored research, and studies that are not representative of real life experience. So unless you've taken some kind of a course in in biostatistics and can can look at a study and realize when you're getting hoodwinked, um, I would generally say don't buy that supplement or that whatever that's being touted because it's probably a complete waste of money and time and expensive uh, waste flushing down the toilet. So, okay. So macronutrients, everybody here is probably extremely familiar with these terms, you know, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. It's always assumed that athletes need more protein. And I say always, because it's pretty much in every area you're going to, you're going to read this over and over and over. And I've been contacted by moms, concerned moms who are like, you know, Eileen, how do I talk my teenager out of taking these supplements that everybody at the gym is telling him he needs to take? And, you know, the, the, the child won't listen to mom because what does mom know? And then this assumption is that these athletes need more protein significantly more than they really do need it. Now, yes, protein is important for everyone, but excess protein intake is dangerous for everyone, including athletes. And what I mean by dangerous is how it impacts the body, the kidneys, the, the liver, the, I mean, it just goes on and on. So we really want to be focusing on carbohydrates. And I could have made this whole talk just about these topics, but I'm just giving you some cliff notes here. Uh, you know, carbohydrates are used for energy, particularly during intense exercise. So if you're going to be muscle training, you want to make sure that you've consumed some carbs. And then that energy, what it actually comes from is the plasma glucose, which is the product of your body metabolizing the carbohydrates. And then there's a breakdown of the liver and the um, muscle glycogen, which gets stored. I think it's about 500 uh, grams of glycogen gets stored in the muscle and the liver at any given time. And your body will, will use that as well. And then it'll restore. But you really got to have enough dietary carbohydrate preserves because it preserves the protein in your tissues. And I know that kind of sounds like, huh? I thought my muscles needed protein, but you need carbs to keep from losing muscle tissue. Because if you're not consuming enough carbs, you can lose protein from the muscle itself. Um, you know, and the higher the level of exercise intensity, the greater reliance on the carbs as the source of fuel. And unfortunately, despite these facts, which unfortunately are not well known or well received or ignored by people on, on the, the other side of the spectrum. Um, you know, these athletes continue to insist that protein intake is the most important and it's not true. 
It's just not true. Uh, a high intake of protein does not improve athletic performance when it displaces dietary carbohydrates. And there are lots of studies that can, can back this up, uh, but I didn't want your eyes to glaze over and go over study after study. But you can see here the cliff notes. Carbs you know, provide the energy to meet most calorie needs. They will optimize the stores of glycogen in your body. They literally promote muscle recovery after exercise, which is key. And a lot of people think, oh, I need that protein shake after exercise because my muscles need that protein to build. That is completely inaccurate. Um, the, the carbs provide energy during practice and competition. They help you to maintain your glucose levels so you don't get that drop in sugar. Um, and they sustain glucose levels during physical activity. So you're going to have more endurance. Okay. Um, so the protein basics, just uh, a couple of slides here. Um, you know, anabolism, that's when the body builds new tissue. So it's building. And then there's catabolism, which is when the body breaks down the tissues and the amino acids for fuel. You don't want your muscles getting catabolized. You want them, if you want them to grow, you want them to anabolize. So uh, proteins are broken down into the amino acids, which contribute to the amino acid pool if you're not consuming enough calories and enough carbs. And then those amino acids are drawn from the pool to synthesize the proteins to build muscle or to be used as energy if carb and fat cannot meet energy needs. So when it comes to athletes, only 15% of, of calories is needed to provide what's adequate. And that's based on the assumption that the calorie intake is adequate. And a lot of the times you'll get these athletes who will say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do my protein shake. And once I start, you know, having that protein shake, oh, I started gaining muscle. Oh, I started to feel better. I had more energy. Well, they weren't consuming enough calories. It really didn't have anything to do with the fact that they were taking in more protein. It's because they were taking in more calories. And you can read it right here. Carbohydrate has a protein sparing effect. If enough carbs are consumed, the protein will not be burned for fuel and it can be used for other functions. So it actually makes your body more uh, efficient at storing the protein that you do consume. And then research does show the maximum rate of protein that's used for non-energy uses, which is to build muscle, is 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. So you don't need to be taking in massive amounts of protein, even plant protein. And if more is consumed, the body has to decide to store it as fat or get rid of it because it's excess. And then either one of those options results in the nitrogen release, which creates the high acid load, which creates potential damage to kidneys and potential dehydration. And this is a little picture here. When you're consuming uh, animal protein, what happens is uh, proteins have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Carbohydrates have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. They don't have the nitrogen. But when you're consuming a lot of protein, you get the excess nitrogen, which create, which ends up leading to uric acid and sulfuric acid in the bloodstream. And then your body removes calcium from the bones to buffer that acid load because your bloodstream has to maintain a pH of 7.35 to 7.45 in order to maintain life. And so it works very, very hard to keep you alive. And now, of course, now that you've taken that calcium from the bones and it gets used to buffer the acids, it ends up going through your kidneys, can end up with kidney stones, um, but they, there's lots of studies that show that the calcium in the urine correlates to the amount of protein ingested. So it, it really does make a difference. You don't wanna overwork your kidneys. You don't wanna stress out your body because of all of this. So, you know, most athletes, they don't get the right amount of calories to support their activity levels and the growth and maintenance of the tissues. And if you notice here, it says calories, it doesn't say protein. And so burning the protein generates a lot of the metabolic waste that we just talked about. You're much better off to have that cleaner burning fuel, which is carbs. And then exercise does increase protein retention, which means that intense physical exercise doesn't increase protein requirements because your body works more efficiently to retain the protein that you have. And then even the Institute of Medicine says no additional dietary protein is suggested for healthy adults undertaking resistance or enduring exercise, endurance sex. So even they say you don't need to add protein, but for some reason, nobody's paying attention to this. And when it comes to protein and muscle development, athletes who report that they've become bigger and stronger, 
believing it's because of their protein supplements or their shakes. It's just because of extra calories consumed. And if you're not taking in enough carb, that will compromise your skeletal muscle protein use and how it how it synthesizes it. So when it comes to food and, uh, you know, I'm listing a few things here, building muscle requires resistance training. You cannot build muscle in the kitchen. If that was the case, we'd never have to go to the gym. We'd never have to lift a weight. We'd never have to do a squat or a push up. It requires resistance training. You want low load, high volume training is better than high load, low volume resistance activity because now you're going to, you know, potentially do some harm. You really want to be a skilled athlete before you start doing that kind of thing. Um, but maintenance of adequate calorie intake, you it's needed for increased activity levels. So if you're going to work harder, you are going to need some more calories. Higher carbohydrate intake will avoid the use of protein for fuel, and it can use it for your muscles or wherever your body needs it. And then distribution of that protein intake throughout the day is required to build muscle and then carb and protein after exercise. You want to avoid consuming protein alone because carbs are what is needed to replenish the glycogen stores and help the muscle recover that, that, that post-exercise soreness. Carbs will help with that. And so does some uh, gentle stretching or lengthening of the muscles. And then Finishing up on the nutrition take of it, the hydration. It's really important. A lot of people are not drinking enough water. A lot of athletes do not drink enough water. They're, they're not remaining hydrated throughout their performance. You use a tremendous amount of heat, um, you know, uh, is produced by your muscles when you're working them. You're losing water. You're losing sodium through that sweat. It's really important that you're replenishing your body with water, um, and then a lot of athletes will get dehydrated and drop in blood volume when they're training and they're competing. So, and I know that might not be the case from the audience watching this, but it, you know, you may know somebody and they might need to know this. Um, it happens even when fluids are readily available because they're just not drinking them. And then consequences range from fatigue to potentially life-threatening heat stroke. So why is it so important for muscle because well-hydrated muscles are 75% water. So if you are not drinking enough water, your muscles are not going to be able to perform properly, to build and grow and function well. They're just not going to. And so it's really important that we, we hydrate ourselves well. And then if you're thirsty, it's interesting. Your thirst mechanism might not be working right because you only need about 2% fluid loss in your body to have issues like decreased blood flow to your muscles, reducing your endurance. Maybe you, you struggle with more fatigue, some diminishing returns for your efforts in exercise. And the thirst mechanism, you need to lose about 10% um, of blood volume in order for the thirst mechanism to kick in sometimes, which is really crazy. Uh, it's a lot less sensitive to the loss of blood volume. Um, it, it's just crazy. So the two most important things about this, the factors affecting your fluid intake is your thirst and your taste. Insufficient water intake is often due to a lack of thirst sensation. People are like, oh, I'm just not thirsty. It doesn't matter if you're thirsty or not, because by the time you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated and, you know, drinking can be a result of habit. I mean, or driven by desire for like warm or cold fluids. So, but you've got to be drinking. Um, you really do. So um, significant water loss is needed before that thirst sensation can kick in. And that's just, you don't want to wait until that happens. Okay. The last topic, muscle training and aging impact. So, you know, what's your muscle fiber type? You learned about type one, type two, fast twitch, slow twitch, you know, red, white. Well, all of your muscles are a mix of fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. Whether you have more of one or the other depends on your activity level and your age, but you can influence how your body um, has this balance. You can actually influence and promote one more than the other. And that's the best part. It does not matter how old you are. So 
you got a lot of, you know, non-athletic individuals. So these are people who are not performing a lot of athletic activity. Typically, they're about a 50-50 balance. So if you want to start strength training and you need more of the slow twitch, um, then, you know, you, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're like, um, well, and I don't know if I, if I just, sorry, uh, you, you want more fast. Yeah. You want slow twitch. I said it right. I'm, I'm thinking I, nope, I am misspeaking because I'm getting ahead of myself. If you're going to want to be doing the weight training, you do really want more of the type two. And, and that's because that's going to help you to perform the power and the repetitions with the weights. Um, now, if you've got some highly skilled top performing athletes, you know, they're, they're doing a lot. They've got a real high percentage of type two here. They've got a real high percentage of type one versus the 50, 50. But if you're just your average person out there, but you want to gain strength and muscle and all of that. Um, there are lots of other variables that will take you from your starting point to where you want to get. So you can see here, I put question mark aging causes because this is what's reported um, that aging causes a loss in lean muscle mass. So much percentage per decade at, you know, starting in your thirties and forties and all of this, but we have to take into account that if they're studying the general population and the general population is living in drive through fast food restaurants, is it really accurate to spread that, that data across all people? Or is it more dependent on their lifestyle and how they're feeding their bodies? The same thing with sarcopenia. Um, you know, they're saying that, but then again, when you look at the data about sarcopenia, which is the term for someone who's older, who now has more fat mass than muscle mass in, in say the thigh muscle or someplace else in the body. And uh, then of course, this has a decline in those fast twitch fibers, um, especially the type 2B. There's type 2A and type 2B, and I didn't want to get too specific with you all here. Uh, also an increase in the slow twitch fibers. So is it really age or is it activity and lifestyle? A lot of the data shows that sarcopenia is because people stop exercising, people stop physical activity. So it really isn't age then, is it? And then since those fast twitch fibers are larger in size than the slow twitch and they're metabolically more efficient, a loss of lean muscle mass can contribute to what's called age-related metabolic dysfunctions, but those are really more secondary aging issues than primary. Um, yeah, and, and then the body composition changes even an increased risk of falls. But that again has to do with losing strength that is, is not, we're blaming age for everything. And it's absolutely, it's, it's just infuriating to me because it's not true. I mean, you know, well, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that will just completely combat this. And resistance training can combat this decline. It can, absolutely can. So the slow twitch, the type one, the red fibers that are developed through endurance training, like low resistance, high repetition, or long duration, low intensity. So your marathon runners, your, your, your long distance, those kind of things. And then the fast twitch type two white fibers are developed through strength training. And the more you strength train, the more of these your body will develop, which is very, very cool. I think it's amazing our bodies can do this. It can also recruit the slow twitch fibers because endurance training at high intensity intervals can be effective in improving aerobic power. So it can help you to be better aerobically as well when you build more of these. And then tapering during the training programs, reducing your volume and your intensity can also improve the strength and power of the type 2A fibers without decreasing the type 1 performance. So just working to get more of these doesn't mean you're going to have less of this. That's the bottom line there. And then muscle soreness, the causes um, lower range of motion, reduced strength, lower performance level. This will peak about one to two days after you do the workout because you've literally broken down the muscle if you've done it correctly and safely and appropriately. And this is called delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. 
normally lasts for two to four days. It depends on how much breakdown you created. Uh, most often it's due to a new activity or an increase in intensity or duration. So you're doing an exercise you've never done before, working muscles a way you haven't done before, um, hopefully safely and appropriately and correctly. And and or you you are somebody who's been doing that movement, but you've now increased your weight or you've increased your number of reps. Like I did um, what would be called a pyramid set yesterday when I did squats. I, I started with a lower weight, did more reps, and then increased my rate and decreased my reps. I did that a couple of times. And then I went back again and decreased the weight and increased the reps. So it was like a pyramid. We went up and down. So I did five sets. So um, so my legs are a little, little tender, a little sore today but not stopping me from doing anything. You know, you, you, you use common sense. You don't want to make yourself where you can't walk. And, and this happens, you know, from micro tears in the muscles and you've got all these chemicals that occur because of that. And then damage to the muscle or the micro tears, you get that production of the reactive oxygen species, which is, and then a reduced use of ATP, adenosine, adenosine triphosphate, um, and then reduced use of that is the likely cause of the lower strength levels. So this is why you have reduced strength while you're recovering. And, and think about it, the muscle has been injured slightly appropriately so that it can repair and grow bigger. If you don't create that soreness, and this is where that no pain, no gain comes in, which is such nonsense and so misunderstood by people. If you don't create muscle soreness from your strength training, you will not gain in muscle strength or size. Now you might get a little stronger over time because you know you are working and you're doing more and your body is able to do more when you do that. But if you don't cause those little micro tears, you're not going to get hypertrophy. The muscle isn't going to increase in size, which is really what gives you your gain in your strength. And then all those supplements that are re recommended for recovery, very little evidence to support, very little effect. So save your money. Um, and then, you know, dehydration, you know, well hydrated athletes have a much better blood volume and it does dilute all of those chemicals. So you have less soreness when you're better hydrated. And then when they looked at the delayed onset muscle soreness in these 10 untrained men, they divided them into well hydrated and dehydrated, both experienced the delayed onset muscle soreness, but 44% more in the dehydrated group. So you really want to be hydrating yourself. That will minimize the soreness that you experience, but you will still get some soreness if you do things correctly. And there's a reason for that. There's a purpose. If you're rehabbing, if you're attempting to um, resolve pain or some issue in the body, it's, it's not no pain, no gain then. You don't want to be creating pain then because now it's a whole other ball game and, uh, and, and it's so important that you don't do that. So better options for recovery, you know, a plant-based diet, the animal foods contain high levels of arachidonic acid, which can lead to increased inflammation, um, not even just the nitrogen and the, the high acid load and pulling calcium from the bones, but there's something called arachidonic acid, which is essential, but your body can um, convert uh, from the plant oils into arachidonic acid and make what it needs on demand versus getting overloaded with it. Um, more than it needs, which promotes inflammation in the body. So plant foods are very low in arachidonic acid and you, you're going to get, you know, that anti-inflammatory effect. It's just a beautiful thing. So let's finish here. we got like three more slides. This is how does a skeletal muscle grow? Hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is an increase and in growth of muscle cells. There's two types. There's myofibrillar which is when the muscle contraction, um, which is a growth of the actual parts of the muscle contraction. And this will increase strength and speed. And then there's sarcoplasmic, which is increased muscle glycogen storage, which increases energy storage and endurance. So you want both. Um, there's something called a sarcoplasmic reticulum in the cell. And, and you really want both of these things. And you don't even need to know this you just need to know that when you're training properly, when you're eating properly, when you're hydrating properly, success happens. And, and this, I, I wanted you to see this. This is Cy Perlis. 
He was 91 years old and he broke the world record for bench press in June of 2013. He was 91 when he did this. He set a new world record for his age group at 187.2 pounds. Now, when I first shared this in a conference a few years back, uh, I asked the audience, was there anyone there who had could bench press 187 pounds? There were all kinds of men in the audience and nobody raised their hand. That's that's a lot of weight to bench press. Um, the, the record prior to him breaking it was only 135 pounds. So, and that was back like eight years prior. So he really blasted that record. Now here's the cool part. Cy did not begin weightlifting until he was 60. And he didn't start competing until he was 86 years old. And the last time I, I did some research on him, which was recent, he also, he was still weight training at 95 years of age. Now, you know, the, so he was 91 in 2013. I, I couldn't find anything recent. So I'm not even sure if he's still with us because that was, you know, 11 years ago, which would make him 102. Um, so I don't know if he's still with us, but he's proof and it, he's not some outlier. This is, our bodies are physiologically capable of doing this no matter our age. So there are three major players in growing muscle, three major players. You want sufficient calories and you gotta have lots of carbs. You need sufficient water intake and you need sufficient resistance. You've gotta work. You can't grow muscle in the kitchen. Um, and then, you know, old and young people build muscle the same way. Doesn't matter your age. Now, many of the biological processes that turn exercise into muscle are reported to become less effective as you age. And I'm currently buried in the, the research right now. I didn't want to get into that here because I'm still pulling together some facts and looking at data. Um, you know, the research reports that it appears to make it harder for older people to build strength. However, a lot of what's that's based on is the secondary aging conditions, which are lifestyle and nutrition. So the bottom line is it's critical for everybody to continue exercising as they age. And if you enjoyed this and you really want to learn more, the end of this month, I'm hosting my first ever power aging boot camp. I'm going to be teaching things that I've never taught to the public before. Uh, I really want everyone to move better and feel stronger than ever, regardless of their age. I've had people over 100 years old doing squats and parallel bars in nursing home settings. So, and I didn't, you know, do it to, to beat them up. You, you have to work according to your ability, not your age. And, and if you believe just because you're older, you can't grow muscle, you can't get stronger, or you're destined to get weaker, then that's a mindset that you have to change because that mindset is gonna impact your choices and your, your activity. And the activity change based on your mindset is what leads to all the negatives we don't want to happen. So hopefully um, you all enjoyed that. And so now the slides are done, I'm gonna go downstairs to my gym and show you a couple of really basic movements, really basic strength training, kind of starting, you know, 101 kind of thing with modifications. And for those of you who are pretty fit, you know, you can really go for it, but I'm going to show you some things that hopefully will benefit you. So, Thank you. And I hope you have time for questions because I'm seeing yes. quite a few of them. And this was wonderful and was very inspiring about that guy because I, yes. I too do not strength train, but if he could wait till he's in their sixties, maybe I can wait till I'm in my seventies. Who knows? <laughs> All right. I'll see you downstairs. All right, I'll see you downstairs. And while she's changing her uh, venue, I'll tell you who's on the show tomorrow. We have two wonderful shows. Actually, we have someone that works with strength training, Maxime. He's going to be on the regular show of Dr. Lori Marvis at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And they're going to talk about effective weight loss. And then at 11 a.m., we have Brittany Giroudi, and she's going to be making some tortilla soup. The best way to get your question answered is to just subscribe at chefaj.com. We send an email out just once a week telling you who the guests are, but I do my best depending on the guest and how many questions to also get questions from the chat that I see in the chat, which is on YouTube, because it's a YouTube show. And I, I am now on Instagram, so I'll try to go over there as well. Here's Eileen in the gym. All right. I am here. Okay. So I want to show you 
Um, when it comes to strength training, it's important that you're focusing on the big muscles. I know everybody wants, you know, they want those, those guns, they want those biceps, they want those triceps, they want those things, you know, they want those quads a popping. you might want a six pack. I know I didn't talk much about core strength. Um, core is actually from your nose to your toes. So I don't want to digress. But you want to focus on the big muscles. And if, if strength training is something you've never done, you don't want to start off with bicep curls. You don't want to start off with a tricep push down because you may lack the core integrity of your body to allow your arms to do resistance training without aggravating and getting some kind of a tennis elbow, some kind of a wrist issue, some kind of a shoulder issue because it's a physics thing for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when I go to, to lift something with my biceps, there is an equal and opposite reaction that allows my biceps to lift the weight up as some other part of my body is pushing down. And so if, if the core integrity of my body is not there, my biceps are kind of hanging out to, to, you know, and they're in trouble. And now they're really struggling trying to do it. And that's where you can end up with itises, you know, tendonitis and tendinosis and, and, and all kinds of things, bursitis and all of that. So if it's, if you're new to strength training, focus on the big body parts. Don't try to do small body parts and, and gain a little, little experience, a little bit of strength there, make sure your core is working. And then you can start doing, uh, smaller body parts, but you also want to focus on the fact that you are not trying to isolate something. And, and that's because your muscles don't work in isolation. That's not how the body works. And a lot of, of strength training, a lot of um, bodybuilding per se is to isolate muscles because they, they really want to define things. Now, if you want to do competition, that's a whole nother conversation and we're not having that right now. So the goal here is the best movements to start with would be squats and push-ups. Now, I know some of you might think, I can't do a push-up. Are you crazy? Well, I'm going to show you lots of modifications to start building strength so that eventually you will be able to do a push-up. Uh, many of the people watching this right now are probably familiar with that commercial, Help, I've Fallen and I Can't Get Up. Well, a lot of that happens because the person doesn't have the strength to push up off the floor. Now, sometimes it's because they get injured. They break something when they fall and they're, they're kind of stuck there. Um, it's a very sad thing. I don't even want to go into it. I've had home care patients who had that happen to them. Um, and it, it's just tragic. But, but you, want to you want to be able to do a push-up. This is, this is key. You want to be able to do a squat. Now, I know some of you might have some musculoskeletal issues, conditions, and you'll have to modify everything. So I'm going to give as many modifications as I can, and then I'll answer questions, AJ, and, and if anybody needs any additional help or concerns about other things. So let's start with squat. I like to teach a squat where you've got a chair behind you because you're going to focus more on max, gluteus maximus, right? Max which is your power source. Everybody wants buns of steel, right? That's what you need. And so we're gonna work on max if we, if we have a chair behind us and we're pretending we're gonna sit, it really focuses more on max. It also helps to load the hamstrings. And a lot of people in a gym, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna push against a machine to strengthen their hamstrings. But I want anybody watching this right now or even by recording later to put in, in the chat, when do you ever do this movement in real life? for any reason whatsoever. I've never had anybody tell me. So <laughs> um, it, it's not how the muscle's designed to work. It's really designed to get longer with control as you go to sit. Um, so, and it's also designed because it comes down and wraps around the knee below the knee joint. It's designed to help straighten the knee and control rotation. So it, it's got very different function according to the context of how you're using it. Yes, it will straighten, or I'm sorry, it will flex the knee. It will bend the knee when it shortens, but that's not really how it functions in life. So why do we do that repetitively against resistance? So when you do a squat, you're really training max, you're training your hamstrings. Obviously quads are working. If you're not going backward, and you're going forward more, it's not a terrible thing, but your quads are gonna load more here. And if you've got any knee issues, your knees might not be happy about it. And so let me mention some modifications. You can put your feet in almost any position when you're doing a squat, if you're only using body weight, 
and you're you're you got a knee or a hip that's not happy about the movement, you may be able to find a foot position that makes it happy. And you can do squats in literally 27 different foot positions where if you're just doing them side by side or one foot forward a little bit or the other foot or you're going wide or you're going narrow, if you're toes in, you can have toes in and one's forward, toes out, one's forward. You can do all different foot positions because when you're doing real life and you're squatting down under the sink to get something out from under the sink, you know, that big heavy pan for that one holiday meal, you, my feet right now are not in this perfect hip width apart, toes forward, making sure they're right under my hips and everything is perfect. That's not how real life works. You know, you go to get something out of the trunk of the car, you go to pick up that big bag of mulch when you're doing gardening. You're not worried about perfect form when you do those things because that's life. So when you're doing squats, you can do squats with different foot positions. Now, if you're doing, you know, power lifting and, you know, I'm going to try to do my maximum squat with a, with a bar across my shoulders, that's a whole different story. I'm going to make sure I've got this perfect form so that I don't injure myself. But if you're just using body weight or even some fairly light weights, you can alter your foot position. And you may notice that your knee is happier if your toes are turned out just slightly, or if your foot's forward just slightly, then at least you can perform the squat. And, and performing the movement is, is key without pain, without any discomfort. So let me show you. You wanna make sure you've got that there. And if you keep your knees against the chair, now you can see I've got my heels under the chair because that helps me to keep my balance. And I, as I go back, I'm going back and down. So my knees are staying against the chair. They're not going forward. And the lower I go, the more max and my hamstrings are working and loading. And you can see my toes are kind of coming up because I'm sort of balancing on my heels. And then I'm pushing back up through my heels. So if you've got any balance issues, if you've got any strength issues, hold on to the kitchen sink, put a chair behind you. And just go as low as you can go without your hands having to pull you back up. You've got to push through your heels. So if all you can do is this, that's a starting point. That's a starting point. If you can go all the way down, that's, you know, that's even better. A lot of people have decreased range of motion because they've got weakness. It's not even because the joints won't perform the motion. If they're laying on a table, the joint has the motion, but they can't take that motion up when they're weight bearing because they don't have the strength to maintain that position as, as they're, they're changing. So it's, it really strengthening can improve range of motion even. So, you know, depending on why it's, it's not there. So lots of ways to do squats. Those are, it's huge. It's the big rocks of the body. It works, it works calf muscles. It works everything. And if you're really fit and you hang on to some weights, you know, I'll do this with, um, with some weights. So, you know, you can just, just take some weights and, and you can hold them down here and you can get a really good workout. Um, but if you're, if you're really wanting to build muscle, you, you want to work to fatigue. But if this is brand new to you and you've never done strength training, start light, start easy. You can progress as quick as your body tolerates well, where you've got just a little bit of soreness the next day. You know, you might be go like this and go, oh, I feel a little tender. You know, oh, Max feels a little tender. When you go to use the toilet, you might notice Max is a little tender. Um, that's okay. Hamstrings are a little tender. As long as you can walk and you haven't injured yourself, it's, it's a good thing. Beca and make sure lots of carbs, lots of water so that you can promote, um, you know, decrease that delayed onset muscle soreness and promote hypertrophy of the muscle. Now, the other thing is a push-up. For those of you who cannot do a push-up, I'm going to show you how you can start off, especially if you're brand new to anything like this at all. You can use the wall. You don't even have to get down on the floor and you put your hands against the wall and depending on how far back you bring your feet, you'll have a little more weight bearing and you can do a push up right into the wall. Now, if you're really weak up there, you can do what I call a scat press, which means you keep your elbows straight and then you just do this. And that's my scapula going back or my shoulder blades, right? Some people call them their angel wings and just let those come back and that'll work. So I'll show you against the wall here. 
what I'm going to do is I'll just do my scapula. So, and the further back my feet go, the more, and you might need to lower your hands a little bit, but now I'm really getting a nice scap press here. This is a great way to start. Uh, very unlikely to cause pain to anybody and, and you can do it and, and build that upper back muscle strength so that eventually you'll be able to do a push-up. Now, if that's way too easy for you, as I said, you can do you know the push-up here. And the goal is you wanna have your elbows out at like a 45 degree angle. Now it doesn't have to be exact. You don't have to get a, 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 you know, a measuring tool out, but you don't wanna have your elbows go way out here like this. You want them more here. And ideally, if you can, you wanna get your upper arm bone to go parallel to the floor, which means you're gonna have a 90 degree angle of your elbow. That's a nice push up motion. That's, that's your goal. So if you're against the wall, if you can get those elbows at 90 degrees, you know, your head is, is going into the wall. That's a great way to start doing push-ups. You'll be really surprised at how much strength you can gain doing that. And then once you're ready to try the floor, there's a couple of other things you can do. If you still don't have enough strength to do a full push-up, you can do what's called um, an eccentric, or you're down on the floor and, well, here, I think I'll show you. Give me just a second here. Because I think you'll get more out of this if I show you. So an eccentric is when you are just lowering yourself, but you're not strong enough to raise your body back up. Can we everybody see that? I think they can. So the goal here would be, I'm, I'm in position to do my push-up. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just lower my body and then I'm going to use my legs to push back up and then I'm going to do it again. So that's an eccentric. You would just do as many of those as you could do. Um, lower yourself nice and slow. You can also do, um, there's a couple of other things you can do that I was thinking of that I, I completely forgot. But when you're down there, oh, you could be, you can be on your elbows instead of up on the hands because that's going to build the core strength here. The push-ups take a lot of core strength as well. And so if you're down on your elbows, you can do what's called a, 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 a pelvic driver and you can do work here where your pelvis just goes down and up. But this will really help to build the strength of your upper back and your arms and your shoulders and allow you, you know, you can go side to side, you can rotate, you can do all kinds of things that way, but that is really gonna help your upper body to start getting strong enough to do a regular push-up. So there's lots and lots of things that I just showed. Hopefully uh, that helps some of you and uh, you'll be able to get started. So. Nice. All right, thank you, Eileen. Um, do you want to answer the questions from that room? Just right sure. there. Okay, fantastic. Well, you know how you said that nobody really does this movement in nature where you put your heel up to your buttocks, you know, I always think about that when people train people to do triceps. I mean, when in life do we ever really go like that? Shoot, I don't think I've ever done that in my entire life. I would love to high five you right now, AJ. Yeah. Yes. It's weird, isn't it? Okay, so I saw a great question from somebody on Instagram named M-A-N-E-S-847, and he or she says, I'm 61, and I've been whole food plant-based for six years. I walk 40 to 90 minutes, minutes a day. Do I really need weight training also? So walking is um, very beneficial, but it doesn't strengthen your upper body. So yes, you do need strength training. If you want to ensure that as you go into your 70s, 80s, 90s, that you don't have trouble pushing open heavy doors, lifting something out of the trunk of your car. Yeah, you do. Okay, thank you. I don't, I, I, I need to hear that. I don't know why I don't do it. I just don't like it. All right. Here's a question from Janice. And she said, uh, I'd love to get my daily dose of your YouTube videos. Thank you much for all you do. You're welcome. 
And she says, Eileen, I want to begin an overall strength training program, and I wonder what to begin with. I'll need to start at a beginner level as I've not been in a gym for many years. I have access to a local gym or could begin at home with basic equipment. Thank you so much. Okay. So was the question in there advising how to get started or? I think so. Yeah. Cause she said she can either go to a gym or get some equipment at home, but she hasn't been to a gym for years. So she needs a real basic way to get started. Okay. So gyms, um, th there's, there's a flip side on using gyms. If you go to the gym, you're going to work out. Sometimes people get sidetracked if they plan on working out at home, you know, oh, maybe I should do up those dishes. Oh, maybe I should throw that load of laundry in. Oh, maybe I should go sweep the, they just get sidetracked, you know, oh, maybe I'll just check a few emails or, and so the workout just doesn't happen. Um, whereas when you plan and you get dressed and you go to the gym, the workout's going to happen. So it's more consistent that way. The, the flip side of the gym is, you know, using the equipment the machines especially are very much when they were first created meant to meet a you know a man who's five foot ten inches tall and if you don't happen to fit that that body type it's the machines aren't going to fit you they have a lot of different ways to modify the machine to fit you but most people don't know how to use the modifications um or they're too embarrassed they don't want to take the time whatever so if the machine doesn't fit you it's not it's not meeting you at the joint line properly and you can risk injury tendonitis those kind of things it also doesn't help you to uh, gain what I call stabilizing strength, your internal stabilizers. Because if I'm using a free weight, you know, and I and I'm and I'm lifting these, my internal stabilizers are working. If I'm in a machine, and I'm and I'm, you know, the machine is is stabilizing, so my body doesn't have to stabilize. And so now I get off the machine and I think I'm stronger than I am when I'm in real life and I go to lift something heavy because now I have to stabilize it. And it didn't have to when I was in the machine. So I'm, I'm really, I'm very um, against machines per se. I think a couple of them are okay. Like doing leg presses are good because you can, you can do those pretty safely. Um, you know, there's a few machines that are relatively okay, but I prefer free weights. If you're just starting out, you're probably just going to want to use body weight at first. And so being at home might be fine. Watching, you know, some people on YouTube who perform movements really well and make sure they teach modifications and stuff would be a good idea. Um, but squats and push-ups, just starting there. I mean, push-ups work. They work your pecs. They work your triceps. If you do a close grip push up, your triceps are going to be screaming uh, in a good way because you're gaining strength there. Um, shoulders, the, the, your core, and then the squats, you know, everything from the, the waist down. So just those two motions can do phenomenal things. And then pull ups are always a good idea because that's going to really help too. You could get a pull up bar at home or use that at the gym. Um, being at the gym, you ideally would have access to somebody who knows how to teach exercise and could watch your form and make sure you're doing something correctly to prevent injury. So there's pluses and minuses of either. Um, hopefully that, that helped. Thank you. And here's a question. Um, where did I just saw it? Okay. Do you have a, it's about if you have a little bit of her. Do you have a program for strength training that we can join, asks Laura. Well, I'm going to be teaching strength training in the upcoming event. And um, so, and I do have, I do have my online uh, Move Without Pain private club, which teaches all kinds of exercise that you can use weights with that are going to be very beneficial. Um, and then I have my academy as well, which we do live classes every week. So I do have some options out there. Yes. Right. And if you're asking on anywhere but Facebook, meaning if you're watching on Twitter, YouTube, I mean, anywhere but YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, you can't see what's called show notes. That's why if you can watch on YouTube, look under the video and all the information on how to connect with Eileen is there. 
I don't know why this question is anonymous, and but it's so interesting to me, especially when people have just regular first names that we use. But the question asker says, when eating whole food plant-based and exercising, is it necessary to eat more protein like beans before and after aerobic exercise to avoid, to avoid muscle soreness or tendonitis? So well, I think I answered that fairly well in the slide presentation, but in case the person missed it um, or they're not even here and they sent the question in, you do not need to increase your protein intake for exercise. You need to make sure that you're consuming enough calories and they need to be carb-based to not only protect protein synthesis, but to help your, your muscles to recover faster and to perform better with improved circulatory benefit the improved blood blood flow so it's really more about the carbs and the calories and of course being hydrated protein increasing protein intake is not necessary no thank you this is from sheba she says i have to walk briskly up and down the stairs for exercise as it's too icy to walk briskly outside is there anything I should keep in mind to prevent knee, hip, or other problems? And do you offer a class that might be a good substitute for walking in the woods? So that's a really good question. I like that question about climbing up and down the stairs because a lot of people work in buildings where they can use stairs for exercise. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind. If you have knee issues, going down the stairs may aggravate the knees. So if you've got knee issues, you would be better off to go up the stairs and then, you know, go up a few flights and then maybe take the elevator down. Um, but going up would be better than going down. When you go up, if you concentrate on, on pushing through your heels to go up, you can actually use a stair. Um, and I'll show this as a little example. You could stand at the bottom of the stairs and you could be on the stair and hang on and you can go down and up down and up, but I'm pushing through my heel on this foot. So I'm pushing through that heel and I'm really working max and hamstrings. Of course, quads are working too, but you can get a really good workout at the bottom of a set of stairs, um, you know, just with body weight. And then of course you can hold a weight if you're at home and you want to really increase the strength. So, and then a lot of the times people have some issues going down the stairs, especially with their knees, and it's not really their knee, it's their ankle. They may have lost some dorsiflexion, which is when the, the toe comes up toward the calf. So if you aren't able to get a really good dorsiflexion, which means you can keep the heel down and come forward over the toes, then that may be what's causing the knee pain going down the stairs. So just learning how to, to lengthen and load the ankle might eliminate or decrease the pain going downstairs. So stairs can be good. They can be really good, but you got to know those things. Perfect. And the person that asked the question, if they really need to do strength training at 61, asked how many squats and push-ups should we do each day? I'm sorry, how many push-ups? Yeah, how many squats and how many push-ups should we do each day? Okay, that's a, that's a depends question. What's your goal? Where are you starting? I mean, if you're starting off where you're brand new to this and you can barely do 10 of each, eh. So um, ideally, you know, you want to, I know, and I need to say this correctly so it doesn't sound like I'm I'm criticizing anyone, but a lot of the times people want this easy magic, well, I shouldn't say magic, this easy, simple formula. I'm just going to follow that. I'm going to do that every day for the rest of my life and I'm good. The human body thrives on variety. So if you're doing the exact same workout day in, day out, week in, week out, you really lose benefit from it over time because your, your brain kind of gets bored and your muscles aren't really getting anywhere. So you really need variety. So that's why in my private club, I've got 52 different workouts in there, a different one for every single week of the year. And then I've got a deep dive. So for the second year, you can do the same workouts, but you can understand with the deep dive how to do them a little bit differently. And voila, so now you got, you got, you know, 104 different workouts. So, and, and you don't have to do that many different ones, but you've got to break it up. You've got to, even myself, when I'm doing workouts, I'm doing different planes of motion, you know, like yesterday I did um, 
a common step matrix with the lunges. And then tomorrow I'll do an uncommon step matrix with the lunges so that my body is getting variety. So there's no magic number, magic workout that is going to meet needs as long as we're above ground. We really need variety. So, but as far as the number of things, if your goal is to increase size of muscle to hypertrophy, you've got to work to failure which means you have to do enough repetitions where you really don't want to do another one. So, I mean, if I'm grabbing, you know, 40 pounds in, in dumbbells and I'm squatting and I, I get to, you know, I get to 15 and I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, and I'm, and I'm getting that last one in, then I'm going to rest for 30 seconds before I do another set depending. So you've got to work to failure and and how much weight you're pushing and everything if you're trying to get the muscles bigger you have to do that if you're just trying to maintain you don't necessarily have to work to failure but you do need variety so i'm hoping i didn't disappoint the person with that answer thank you uh i have broken my ankles in the past and do push-ups on my knees not feet says lisa is that all right or will that cause injuries no, doing push-up on knees is, is perfectly fine. That's another uh, modification as well if someone doesn't have enough strength. So if you just go down and... So yeah, you can, you can just do this. And now you've got your hands here. And, and now I'm going to get them under here. And so now I can go down and get that nice push-up workout, you know, on my knees. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And just know that you can change your hand position, just like your foot position for squats. If I'm closer, I'm going to get more tricep. I can turn fingers in. I can turn fingers out. I can go wide, which is more pec and less back arm. Um, you know, I can put one forward, one back. You can do all those different positions so that, um, you know, you're getting a different angle. So basically, you know, the person who said, you know, one, it, you can do just squats and push-ups, but if you change your hand and your feet positions, you're modifying it and you're changing it all the time. That's variety. So, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Tracy says, "Is it better to eat before exercise?" So your body, if you're if you're going to be doing endurance, you do want to do some carb loading, um, and. You, <laughs> If you're like an athlete, there's the timing for food is everything. That's very specific and, and requires you to understand your own metabolism and how your body's working if you're doing athletic events and all of that. If you're just, you know, your average person who just wants to go do a workout, you're better off not to eat anything heavy before you go and work out. Ideally, some fruit would be a good idea, uh, even a smoothie, just to be sure that you've got energy so that you can get through the workout. And, and not go into, you know, storage that you don't want to go into. Um, fruit digests in like 15 minutes. I think a banana digests in like 30 minutes because it's a little bit less water content. But fruit is a, is a really good idea um, as well as, you know, maybe a smoothie or something. But you don't want to, you don't want your body to be trying to digest a meal and work a muscle at the same time. It, it, you would want to be eating something, you know, fairly light or at least a half hour before you go to work out, but it would depend on what you ate. Thank you. And Tracy says, what are strength trainings you can do in a very short time duration? Probably the squats and the push-ups would be the shortest time duration because you can do those. If you go really, really slow, um, you know, you don't need to do very many squats, but if you go really, really slow and really, really slow back up, it wouldn't take you very many reps to work to failure. The same thing with a push-up. So those that would probably those two are really so beneficial, and maybe even some pull-ups. Thanks. And last question is from Jolene. What is the best size weight or dumbbells to start off with? Well, that depends on your particular ability at the moment. If you've never strength trained, I would stick with just body weight. Um, and you know, push-ups don't require weights. That's, that's body weight. Squats don't really require weights until you get to the point. If you're not able to do two sets or three sets of 10 squats, you're really not ready for weights. So, and then you want to start slow and easy. I wouldn't add more than two or three pounds at a time. And then you're going to decrease your reps a little bit. 
obviously, if the goal is to work to failure, but I wouldn't attempt you work to failure the first time you try squats. You would be better off to, to kind of get a little bit of, of um, uh, experience under your belt before you go that far. Well, thank you so much, Eileen. This was wonderful as usual. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for two more great shows. And we have at 9 a.m. Dr. Lori Marvis and Maxime and at 11 a.m. Brittany Giroudi. Take care.